Awesome. Well, sorry for the bit of delay, but I promise you it's going to be worth it, right? That's right. Okay, yeah, it's totally going to be worth it. Um, I'm Grant uh, with the Metro Atlanta Chamber, and we are sponsors of the next two sessions today, so we just wanted to welcome everybody. Third point of view. Um, thank you for being a part of the uh, tag as a whole. I think thank you for being interested in this particular subject. This is something the chamber has been working on, and a lot of our partners. And so, is obviously all well, the entrepreneurs behind the idea. To really solve the stream is what's changing in the world. In what needs to occur? What type like of innovation is happening in other like places that can support? Uh, so, to do that, uh, we have an awesome moderator uh, this morning, Cynthia Curry, uh, who's on our team uh, at the chamber, uh, who is our AI quant smart That's city guru. Important. Um, anything that, needs to that be has done. initials after it, On the not a meme side, my favorite example me get, is a meme that stuff. I saw a few years um, ago. But just want to let you know, I appreciate Chuck Norris. Uh, tags, um, and it says Chuck Norris. The chamber to be involved in this summit you know, Chick -fil -A for years and all the other things that are going on. After this, you're going to hear, uh, if you stay in this room, you And so from an investor's point of view on innovation, team stream, not a meme. I want to see where the world is going, but hasn't been delivered yet. Uh, I'm Jim Douglas with Fulcrum Equity Partners. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Grant. Ours is probably a little more uh, fundamental. Thanks, y'all, for coming. And I don't know how many of you got to, to see the presentation this morning, so but I thought you did such a great job on talking about innovation and how to so shake up your brain and really think things a little bit differently. To customer and really, that's a lot about what we're going to talk about today, is really taking a new, fresh look at agriculture and applying technology really kind of seeing what innovation can bring to the table when it comes to agriculture and the leadership and team, the ability to, to, to lead so that customer beyond. My name is Cindy Curry. Um, I've worked with the Metro Chamber. You really and, want to know um, that the, from our perspective that it's, absolute pleasure it's tied heavily to the feedback. Helping build up the 29 I think it's a something that happens probably doesn't happen early enough. That is born and rides on the backs of public private partnerships. And Best all three of these people that are up here with me take today, a risk. I they're going to they're gonna lead you a long way, and if they're not, respect for, they're probably not great that great an idea to begin with. And and the only other thing I'd add to that is beyond innovation is how much, so how broad So I'll let everyone introduce yourself and talk a little bit about kind of your perspective as it relates to the agriculture sector. Yeah, I'm Cindy Curry. I'm with Fulcrum Equity Partners. I've been with the Chamber for about three years. I've been working with Fulcrum Equity Partners since 2013. I've been with them since 2013. Innovation. When you're thinking of innovation, is it a particular thing you're looking for? Is it, and Jim, you touched on this a little bit, is it a business model, is it a product, is it the capability or the general tenor of the team? And is innovation an actual criteria to you as you look at investments, or is it something that permeates an entire decision? So, uh, so I'm, I am uh, subject to the expertise of my, my counterparts here on the panel, but what I do know is that across Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, the operating or revolutionary that we serve, about 30% of the population better, uh, is, or lives in what you consider or a uh, And so this is this One of the most common reasons to, we see uh, entrepreneurs fail at the Atlanta Tech Village um, is that they've built a mousetrap so, uh, that's so only a little bit a topic that we think a lot about. It's only incrementally and, um, better. Obviously also when we see entrepreneurs build big, products and solutions and inventions that are that 10 times to better to than what's out to serve our customers from a great perspective. So it's kind of the angle in which we, we think about it, uh, and, and we're excited to, to be partnering with Big have so so. Michael, how about you? Absolutely. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ponix. Ponix is a vertical hydroponic farming Our company. Percent. So we essentially establish and operate yeah, I'll just add to that. I'm farms I agree 100 percent. And it's crops. Central uh, thesis to that was customer driven, which is right? Soilless farming. You have something. Uh, we you think it's in a good place. Crops in a but clean and controlled environment. Really get out there and so talk to the customers. We can grow all year round. A little bit better uh, than your other guy. Climate proof. Or a whole lot better. So and back to when we have the factors, we can back to that. Essentially, further on site with that product, right? Instead of moving food from one 
one side of the country to the uh, other side. You can grow on site, which is pretty new. And there's a huge trend in you know, uh, sustainability and healthy foods, like kind of understanding uh, you know, you know, what we put into our bodies is pretty important. Maybe becoming more health conscious. Um, essentially, we work with private and public sectors to establish these farms. Um, I wish I could show you a picture of our farm, but it's really awesome because in a 40-foot shipping container, uh, we can grow 4,000 plants in a 40-foot box, which is kind of like 320 square feet. So imagine this bay right here doing about two acres worth of produce. Uh, also, because we're growing in a clean and controlled environment, there's no bugs that we're kind of dealing with. So off the bat, there's no pesticides or herbicides. Uh, and that's really cool. So we moved our startup company from New York City to Atlanta because there's so much happening in this city. Litigate is a strange word in the context, really but I like it. Here in Atlanta, we're partnered with uh, the Metro and Chamber to kind of offer this platform for us to showcase our solution. Uh, this is really exciting because I'm going to start uh, prosecuting the case for my valuation. And, you know, I never thought about it like that. Of, you know, Next time we're talking about a deal, I'll litigate the valuation. Support people coming to the city. And I think food is a good start. Uh, you know, I saw something on YouTube the other day that cities grow uh, uh, really fast based on uh, uh, the farms, where the farms are located. And Paris is way more dense than New York City. And that was like a big, big shock for me because um, you wouldn't expect that. And the farms are actually located 10 or 15 miles away from the city center. So uh, that's what we're here to do uh, with the Ponix. Our mission is to reclassify food as a utility, just like how Power Another lens that I like to look for from an investment point of view on the B2B side is this product or service all under one of two categories. Category number one, mission critical. So is this something that is truly required to run the business? The best example I heard was from an entrepreneur last year. He said during the Great Recession, we had our software in a number of YMCA's. <laughs> Big problem to see unless we heard about food desert. What is a food desert? Oh, that's a it's a low income. Low would go ahead and not parts. pay their electric bill so before they would not pay for their SaaS software. Track is living below so think of that litmus test. Would your customer uh, not pay to keep their lights the on because your software is more your software is more important than that, or would they pay to keep the lights on first? So that was really powerful. That was a really compelling story for me. Now, Atlanta, the second lens I like to look so at it's a, it is, out a whole lot is the than product a city, path right? of we have revenue. Winding, curvy, My co-founder at Pardot like, talked to this one. He's the current right? CEO like, we don't have of the multi-billion dollar marketing it's cloud for Salesforce.com. And this idea of being in the path of revenue is, does your product we have a lot of help me make roads money. that were built. If I turn your product off, will I make less money? And so that those two lenses are very important to me. Mission critical well, that to pass the electricity test, especially around and in the uh, path of revenue. If I turn your product or service off, that we are just by revenue go down. Areas. And if you can answer yes um, to either of those problems or questions, in those areas are not that's as much greater. attractive to private markets to build traditional grocery stores. All right, what you all can see, sense they have a lot of passion uh, about that last time. In my grocery conversations grocery with the team before today, they also had a lot of passion uh, about, about the role customers now, play in innovation. And you all have touched on it already. Um, uh, hypertension, uh, you've all talked about the fact that customers really play a critically important role if you let them play in innovation. I'm just going to let you go off-road on this one for a while. Please talk about that. We had a store. You and I know. And later in this panel, I'll go through some of this. 
innovative ways that fresh food access is happening in some of our most vulnerable communities around the world. That's great. We did the scoring CRM integration forms, but there was no email at all. My co-founder, Adam, uh, before we started Parda, was being the spam king for Holiday Inn. So on behalf of Holiday Inn, he sent out 10 million emails a month, and he knew the email. Then you can have an email deliverability perspective. And so with Adam's background on the Pardot, averse to becoming an email service provider. But the customers kept telling us that the most important thing we could add to the trends in ad tech and some of the technologies that have emerged that kind of help enable this. Finally, we said we're going to go buy a bunch of email servers. We're going to figure out how to do deliverability. We're going to play the inbox games. We're going to pay the taxes to return path and others. Um, and it was the best decision we ever made as a business. Before we get to but yeah. leading up to that, it was Before extremely to difficult to make like that really decision cool internally. But I in think the end, one of the more right innovative decision. things that we're doing, at least for cities' perspectives, is that we're thinking about it systemically, like systematic approaches toward alleviating some of these, these almost epidemic proportions, especially around obesity. Uh, and some of our, that's really impeding the health and wellness of our city. So looking at urban agriculture, many of you probably think urban agriculture, you're probably already picturing, like if we did like the thing with Disney, if I got you a piece of paper to draw like what urban agriculture, <laughs> you're all gonna draw the raised bed box with a few tomatoes coming out, right? You all have that? Well, I want you to think outside the raised bed box, okay? I, I want people to realize that it's part about growing production, which we're gonna hear about, but it's also about aggregation of that production. And staying on production again, it's not just about the small scale, uh, but it's about small intense scale. So a level of intensity per square foot. And really it's not even per square foot, it's really cubic foot. We put a Z value on the production of agriculture, especially when we talk about uh, uh, food grown in the city. So it's all these levels of production based on intensity of growth. And then we talk about aggregation and distribution of that product. We're also talking about how we consume that product and a lot of the communication and culinary skills that go into that. We're also finding a lot about feedback loops as it relates to food recovery. Stuff that's not eaten at this event or conventions like this or breakfast buffets all over the place. What happens to that food? And then also it is part of that restoration of food. Because what is, what, is what is a calorie? It's a unit of what? Energy. energy, right. So we're thinking about the food system as energy flows through the city and how can we capture every ounce of that energy and put it back to especially those that need it the most when they need it the most. So feedback loops, uh, especially in the restoration, uh, that also includes compost. How can we get stuff out of the landfill and use that as an energy source so that production Again, thinking systemically here, that production, our raised bed box, gets the benefit of that yeah, nutrient. We put only back focus on B2B, so I don't really have anything to say on B2C. Like so but in B2B each one of these to to levels them. of our it's urban just, agriculture food system, thing, and it's, it's we crazy have many how, uh, it's many things that are happening. Exactly. Well, they, well, I haven't told them I'm going to litigate them yet. That maybe, they, maybe that's why they like to talk to me. But, but I'm going to try this. Um, no, they, they love to talk. And I say this for operating businesses, and I watch our portfolio companies. Now it's just it's right there in front of you. They're not always going to be right. You're going to be the arbitrator of a lot of information, but it allows you to get these examples you guys talked about probably expanded your team significantly. Uh, right? so you're just, you're, it's not just about the product, farm it's technology, about the like drones, from a product to a company big enough to care about. Like so it's sitting right there in front of you, and you got to use it. Uh, so there's, the landscape has been pretty, pretty wide. The hottest has been kind of the e-commerce space, uh, like door-to-door -door drones, pickup and deliveries. Uh, but I keep coming back to, like, while all that connectivity and logistics is happening, um, the, the substance behind what's being transported is food. And if you go down to the principles of that, I think you know we're still dealing with uh, food that's being harvested early 
just so that it looks good when it gets to the other side of the country. Uh, so when you're walking down the river aisle, you see vibrant colors, aesthetically pleasing looking vegetables. But you know, you may, you may not. Another know example that, that comes to mind is when I bought the Atlanta Techville. All those nutrients so truth be told, the original idea was. So test the market, see if there was a man for entrepreneurs like that wanted to you know, cohabitate with other entrepreneurs. Bodies, you know, where did this and so bought the big building, went to Ikea, spent $40,000 on Ikea furniture, which is really hard to do if you haven't tried. Uh, and there's, we did pay to have them assemble. That was a good chunk of it. And so we outfitted the entire second floor. It was totally empty. Put a bunch of uh, IKEA furniture Mario, and said, uh, "Come, would come all for Illinois. entrepreneurs." And by the uh, end of that first week, we had filled up uh, that are responsible for ninety percent of the space and a rundown building. And those nine counties are in California. And so, so there was so much customer demand so that it gave confidence kind of to kick out the seventeen like traditional crumble. tenants in the building, and so that we could renovate it as quickly as possible and fill it up. With entrepreneurs, and so getting that first initial product market established, that yes, entrepreneurs wanted to be around other entrepreneurs, was really a magic moment for me to say we're going to make this entire place as quickly as possible the best place for entrepreneurs to succeed. It's 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 really exciting to kind of do that now. So. There's a lot of solutions, but I think we still got to focus on uh, the production. Uh, that was another the, we the should have food that kicked out the tenants and renovated instead of playing uh, musical chairs across the floor. Uh, That's a good learning experience. Uh, you know, the, these things are kind of silent killers, and we're putting that into our bodies. And All right. We well, as you can see, they have a. So a lot of passion around that topic, too, on customers. So especially after all of us sat through Duncan just a minute ago, nobody in this room wants to not be innovative or not cre be creative or um, use innovation as anything as good. But there have to be times that innovation in a company is not a good thing. Uh, educate us on how and when that might be. So he has a 40-foot shipping container, and inside there are vertical plants that go. So talk about the technology, kind of the grow computer technology behind that and how much more yield you get compared to a typical farm. And then this, tech, this technology can be scaled into other unused real estate type places. So to make it like easy the, for companies yeah, to build online communities. Yeah, think about so message boards and chat uh, rooms. Think about Reddit or Clean. You guys have like, and so we had this you know, idea that we were going to do this so crowd. We called it eCrowds.com. Right uh, and so we spent a bunch of time and money. We were going to grow our TAM. We were going to build online SaaS community software for businesses to run their own communities, much like what Jive Software and others are today. The challenge was we had this other product that was doing great. And so all the resources, all the best team members, everybody was focused on the product that was paying the bills. And so we hired some junior people. It's on this nascent product. So we have one reservoir that we were doing innovation. These tubes that kind of, they're pillars. So imagine a row of pillars Hear that. that have everybody in the organization uh, like 20 heads product. and it's essentially just recirculating the water and uh, like feeding all the plants. And then on the bottom there's a tray that collects all that water and returns it back to the reservoir. It helps me better appreciate the story of Literally Steve Jobs system. getting the building down the road um, to build the Mac, how we to separate it, the teams, to separate know, the resources. I learned that experience uh, firsthand. And that's my innovation failure. Happy. It's, uh, I just witnessed one, um, and I don't know if you can talk about company in name, it's a plant, it was an Atlanta company, but um, they were dealing with a new innovation. They had a real, a really fantastic product. These plants don't know the well. so environment. Exactly. The CTO uh, was, these plants don't know was interested in the world, was around RPA. Uh, and 
I kind of watched it evolve to exactly what you were talking about, where yeah, so, the uh, organization totally turned against it. To that, the, it was his uh, puppy. Uh, whether it should have happened or not, we ended up stopping it. But whether it should have happened or not, he probably didn't get to the right place because he never gave it a shot because it wasn't outside the organization. Everybody's looking around going, why in the world would we not just take advantage of what's in front of us? And I think that we end up with the right decision, but it's pretty hard in a business that has a really strong product to get the team motivated behind something that would be considered skating to where the puck's going. Uh, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of leadership and risk a ton of disruption, and it's just frankly probably more risky to do than most people would talk about production. So the only way to accomplish business model is move it outside the organization. I remember in the check-free days, we did this little skunk loop. We had the same problem. It's always been, it, this issue's always been there. So you got to isolate it and figure out how to motivate it outside the So, Michael, you said it's a sustainable business model. Can you explain a little bit more of that? Are you making money selling your fruits and vegetables from the container at Ponce and all the other markets that you're at? Yeah, so our, so our operating expenses to run the farm are fixed, meaning we can predict what's going to happen by month 12. So we've had five harvests and we had no crop loss, and we've been distributing that produce right to our neighbors. We have hot city market restaurants. We haven't sold to Kroger because we can't meet that volume, but there's local restaurants and local supermarkets, like smaller grocers, that want this product. It's like, through this, what, a mile that way? Yeah, we want it. Uh, so, uh, so speaking of the operating expenses, it's about 30 cents to grow one, one crop. Whether you're growing lettuce, basil, wasabi, kale, you name it, it's 30 cents. What you do after that, what the market is asking, you could match it or you could beat it. And we offer like prices that you can beat, so it's like, you got this kale from California for you know 20 bucks a case. We can go 15 dollars a case, save your money on petroleum because there's no transportation involved, and you get a higher quality product. So it's really a no-brainer. It's it's about you know there's a saying I think I forget what movie, uh, build it and they will come. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We, we, gotta, we essentially got to do He's that. Too young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you're still in the pilot stage, so these are all the things that you're figuring out, right? Yeah. Another thing you're looking at is selling to restaurants, yeah. to buy a container. Well, oh, yeah. and so we, so through the uh, Living Lab Labs <laughs> program, we moved here six months ago, and that farm is now already sold. That farm is now in Athens, Georgia, servicing the restaurants out there. So six months in, we got our products to five different markets. Uh, people want them, and plus, there's more users that want to join the farming revolution. I don't mean to do the funny years, but that's the buzzword, join the farming revolution. And, uh, in addition to the, the farming aspect and the food sources, um, one thing I'm glad I you said that. that I was trying to get the other thing, so we invest in healthcare services. Well, is the impact to soft, pharmaceuticals and uh, obviously very topical services, issue right yeah, now with um, viruses uh, spreading. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, uh, what I learned was that instead of an embryo that can support five eggs, we have an embryo that can support five vaccinations that's grown over a course of three months. Um, which obviously has an impact on adjusting to things you, like my point here is you can like create that, great businesses. Service arena. Um, these are old stats. Very little to do with but the, the opportunity so to lot use of ways to create a great business. vaccinations uh, um, with a single plan. Yeah, I've witnessed that firsthand. I have no time. idea about these kind of and, and so that can lead to tremendous opportunities, not just for the volume, but also for the All right, uh, for the timeline. To I have one more question before I turn it over to the audience, unless you all are ready. Does anybody have? Have a, have a question. Mr. Reen. Uh, the other thing I was going to add is, you know, we talked a lot about the fresh food aspect, which is hugely important, but in my prior life, I, I worked at an impact investing fund where we had a, a food category and also worked with several food processing. So for those who couldn't hear the question, 
wonderful prelude to it, but when it's too early, when it's too late. The best thing is always fresh food, travel the least amount of distance, but we worked with some technologies and companies. The long answer is the biggest one of which was born out of the state that just right sterilization method using microwave technology. When it wasn't the right timing to be there when the timing was right. So going back to our pardon experiment. Happened you know, to close to maybe less than five percent remains. Um, this time. technology is preserved close to ninety-five percent of the nutrients that um, that came out of your classic because tomatoes so or had several soup lines and some smoothie side. lines. Tasted absolutely phenomenal. The color was side. incredible. The, big the closest thing to fresh food that you could get, shelf stable, um, which just obviously has a lot of impact. So you can't always have you know, the access offline. to. Um, to the fresh food right there. So that was another really um, compelling value proposition for uh, for ag tech, food tech, that, um, that can help preserve nutrients for, for those Google. that uh, don't have access to uh, It's interesting that you bring up the, the financial aspect too, because that is one of the trends that I'm seeing in the space as well, is that because the bigger farms are using marketing data automation data arena was really the catalyst, was really the vehicle for marketers to run campaigns at scale and demonstrate the ROI. So we started in 2007. And we had 100 customers. By 2012, we had 1,000 customers. And so the market really started to take off around 2011. So we started four years prior. But in those four years, we were able to build a business that had a few hundred customers, that had the infrastructure, had the technology, had the talent. And so when the market was ready, we were ready to capitalize on it. In hindsight, if we would have been too early, we might have been worn out by the time the market had arrived, or if we'd been too late, of which there were a ton of entrants once well, it was, was clear say, there wasn't. Especially if you want to know industry-wide like, numbers, agrilist, that point. And agritexture, and that exactly. consulting yeah. firms that do publish and are tracking sort of Or customer-driven. I mean, what you're saying is I had enough customers that were interested in what I was doing. And then agritexture, and then two uh, good sources for right? understanding my how quickly you're It was we talked like about literally earlier. a couple of million There are enough customers that you can get enough data around and it's the dog well and the dog to see that. What, what so, you're building, and just really skyrocket. solving a problem. Uh, but a couple of really cool things just to kind of show you the infrastructure short, supporting this. Other people right right now, the federal government has already issued a number easy, of grants that, are to say that work, we're all working together that's to support what will be the first, basically, leads for buildings. What it is called, it's called seeds. Uh, Brilliant. <laughs> for CEA, uh, is CEADS. So uh, the program is already sort of uh, propping up some of the some of the thought leaders to to uh, kind of convene and, and put together all these considerations that are necessary. So what are the threats to uh, CEA? Well, you build all this great produce, you pump these CEA laboratories, controlled environmental agriculture laboratories, with a bunch of CO2. They get them really, really big and dilute the number of nutrients per 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 item. So you can make them really big. Um, so there's some limitations around CO2. I, I know a lot of the, the practitioners don't, don't believe in that, but there are some data that says that could be a threat. And it's also about water, too, because we're saving a ton, a ton of water on our agriculture, but that's city water that's being used for, so we want to make sure that that city water is recycled and put some safeguards into it. So that's just a skinny, there's many, many guidelines and considerations, but having the federal support, the USDA, to support this from thought leader perspective to build uh, uh, professionals that are going to provide a certification for a lot of these urban CEA farms is really, really exciting. I agree. And as we move forward, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about um, that um, come about, robotics are a huge, huge thing that are being implemented on farms um, where they're taking out the need for that manual labor and they're really allowing it to be done in a more precise way and at a higher volume. So the, ro the robotics pieces from everything from tractors to drones, like we talked about all of that. So um, $4.1 billion is the projected value of uh, money that's going to be spent on robotics and global farming. I've got a few stats that I'll throw out because everybody knows the statistics, right? So sensors, obviously that's another big thing that's being used on farms everywhere to determine what is your soil look like, how wet is it, do you need more water, what's the pH look like, all of those things. Um, Business Insider predicts that there will be 12 
million agricultural sensors installed globally by 2023. So that creates almost um, two and a half million data points per day on a typical farm. So all of that data is kind of pulled together and that's where a lot of this insight is coming from and that's a lot of where the excitement lies in in the ag tech field is we're learning a lot more and we're able to be more sustainable like we've all talked about. So, um, you know, sustainability is such a huge thing and so important. You know, I've been learning a lot about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and a lot of those really fall right in line with ag tech, preventing poverty and innovation and uh, infrastructure and, you know, responsible use of resources. I mean, these are all things that we have to pay attention to um, as we move forward and, and as we, you know, try to create this world with what we have now for, you know, several more billion people. Um, so we have 10 minutes. I don't know if we want to take questions or if y'all want to talk about I want to make one <coughs> announcement. Uh, and this just got approved on Monday. Mary so Council. Yeah. Uh, Mary, can we, uh, the City of Atlanta just won a $600,000 grant, a three-year grant, to develop a hyper-local food promotion program to help entrepreneurs like Michael uh, support food. Uh, the brand is going to be called Atlanta Grown, and it's going to be like a sister program to Georgia Grown. So it's going to be the one of the first times we really collaborate with the Department of Agriculture on the state level. One of our, our, basically our biggest champions has been the Commissioner Gary Black, our Agriculture Commissioner of the state, and welcoming ag land to grow and products. That's a really important so you'll question. See no that. Why is that important? How we're going to use technology? All the uh, labeling is going to be tech interface so that you can, through augmented reality, understand how many miles it came from, uh, who grew it, uh, and how it was grown. So the ecological integrity of how it was grown. Who grew it, the cultural relevancy from the farmer's perspective, Too many times where it was grown, and then hopefully it's been taught to push them faster than their well. markets are. A lot of areas for technology is being paid attention to it. We still build a good business smartly over that time period. George Powell. If you've done enough I you might know a little more than I have. Rare. So, Georgia Tech got a $100,000 grant to put into ag tech. I'm going to say, why don't you do that again? I've said that myself. So, that's an excellent hand. People spend money too fast trying to force something that's not ready to happen. Area. Um, so we're that's fairly recent. The, the flag recent. has been firmly planted that Atlanta will be the leader in controlled environment agriculture for the southeast. Which makes perfect sense because we're a uh, you know, community okay. based on agriculture. And so it only is perfect to just take it to the next level. We have a really, really strong technology ecosystem in Atlanta and we're built on agriculture from our history. So marrying the two is really just um, you know, meant to be in Atlanta made. So. Does we have a question? Yes. So I work with foreign, di foreign direct investment, yeah. and I was just wondering where you see this technology coming from, as you see more and more international companies coming since Atlanta will be the, the hub for the Southeast. Where can we sort of anticipate them? The question was that uh, she is curious about MTI and where the technology is coming from. I mean, I would say a lot of it. Yeah, it's Holland, Japan, uh, yeah, Eastern European countries, uh, and so we have Japan, power laws. Japan is the leading. Uh, Probably out of necessity. Yeah, yeah. So that's where they're having the greatest space. The Holland, they, have, they don't have much space. They have to get their back. Anybody else? Yeah. And where's the uh, health insurance? And so there's an old on this. Um, there's a lot of talk about social determinants of health, yeah. food deserts. I mean, then they do on start ways pages. of creating fresh health. So to do, to where are the they, they try to do. From either uh, healthcare providers and the market insurer side. You're seeing it in the uh, basically the greedy healthcare, they are greedy. Uh, Do you have much greater opportunity? Teaming up with insurance. But again, right, right now there was old McDonald's right next to Grady. They're turning that into basically a food distributor. Think of like a food, like a pharmacy, but your prescription can be filled at a grocery store where there's discounted price. So you're going to see a little bit of like where you see like a, a canned dispensary of like Atlanta Community Food Bank. So the question was, are there examples? You see a lot of fresh food in those boxes subsidized by the healthcare industry. Yes. Um, so a lot of this conversation is focused on the technology and the capability to do this. Um, I look at other industries like recycling where there's a lot of knowledge and, and capability, but the public education is what's lacking to actually drive behavior change. So I'm curious of, you know, pairing with the technology, how are you guys looking at the human needs of going in and actually has been educate people? I mean, even as you said today, like, 
the fact that the distance to travel is deteriorating the trains. I literally just sat there like, I can't tell you what I'm talking about. I'm not going to do that. Today, so today, I feel like we're very well changed through here. And if we yeah. don't have that information, right. how are we reaching yeah. people in advance? And so it's really, you know, figuring out if the value add that you receive to provide to the entrepreneurs matches up with the value add that we're looking to for get at that time. But it is a really challenging market right now because mean? there's so much Why do I care? Um, so looking for work, and work and those especially certain for you. The fact that you can get in yeah. yeah. and search for you. Yeah. But I mean, it really just takes, ask where your food comes from. Who grew it? What kind of level of integrity did they grow it with? And hopefully all of y'all will go share what you learned today. Okay, last it's question. Village, you know? I mean, and we have just a couple minutes like on this. this. Um, Your favorite innovation story that you have been involved in, either as a board member, founder, co-founder, CEO, doesn't matter. And why? Why did it Why did it make your favorite list? So my favorite story. So educating people on how to cook. Um, I mean, these sort of gra grassroots level programs are hugely important. And then I'll also mention Georgia Tech. Um, has God, I want to start it. People in technology, and the whole goal is to understand uh, how technology and people can, can be uh, married was around to, job to change behavior. So this is a hugely important question. I don't think we've cracked the net yet, but I mean, it's definitely something that needs to be um, thought about and addressed. And sometimes it happens at a grassroots level. Take it up I just call it a LinkedIn uh, scraper unofficially. And that uh, chefs were putting up uh, like a chef advisory board. So oh. that when we're the education Data. happens when you're at the restaurant, when the chef uses it, oh wow, chef, thank you. Why? Like, what is? What are Told us to stop. Exactly. But we had seven million dollars. That was the new one. It's possible for a variety of reasons, but the main reason was against it. And so with $7 million of revenue, Kyle decided to go all in on a new product that would orchestrate the process. Right, so Salesforce.com is really a sales engagement engine. Product, so we, now the sales so the Aglanta grows a lot program and the timing uh, was right grows, basically has right. taken over a number of vacant properties actually 10 right. you can learn more about the program the rest at aglanta.org now the company is one of the it's fastest growing companies so that's 10 properties we did the urban food forest at Browns Mill it's the largest food forest in the country it is going to be again these are more innovations uh, of like so basically uh, uh, I, I can go on and on so today, so I'm going to skip over a lot of the reasons how, space, how I don't know how to talk to you later, and other investors in Atlanta has a number of space. The mayor was very, the mayor was very, very, very specific, and her process of software uh, changed uh, dramatically CD. because very, very important. 90% of the Atlanta work that we were doing was in food desert areas and supported them through a lot of these technological programs and access to the and opportunities. I log watch the company as I the AgTech conference. Not sure what that is. QA software, they came back in. Yeah, at the conference said, is slated for July 28th at the state of round, we came in. And we haven't put it out yet. And that company took off with a lot of great people, some that from Last David's question. former um, company uh, that were part of that. But it continued to reshape an industry around how you QA development, embedding QA into the development cycles versus, hey, QA happens at the end of the end of the cycle and you show up to your executive meeting and say, huh, but I'm a quarter late and half of what you said, I still just get done, get done. Also, the and they changed the way you know, QA is done. Uh, so even though it's a boring so space, it took me a while to go, am I really going to do this? It's turned out to be one of the more fulfilling things to watch. That's going to help the harvest this stuff. You know, spend $100,000 on a hydroponics system, you can grow all year round. They're just like, are you against me? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we say the average farmers age 67, the average urban agriculture is, is hipster. You know, yeah. like, well, and so, so also technology awesome. coming into agriculture, it's a great kind of sign off point, is bringing the new generation of farming, which is really huge. I mean, we're getting a lot of younger um, generation of people that are putting their science and their technology degrees to work on farms, which is so super cool because there was a real lag um, for a while that, that there were just no no use moving into that industry. So farming is becoming cool again, right? Not that I always thought it was cool. I grew up on farms. <laughs>
<laughs> I, we're getting the stop, but we can answer yours. That's my dream. Yeah. Thank you so much.